just to start there. All right. First of all, we need to review some of principles of physics. So there are few concepts that you already know. And those, one of them is basis of our operation here. So let's look at Newton's laws of motion. Newton's laws of motion. These are all materials that you have learned in physics. The first one is very important for us because you have heard this theory a lot, and that is when some of the forces applied to an, an object is equal to zero. That object, if it's stationary, remains stationary, or if it's moving in a constant velocity, it's going to continue with that. So that is, well, of course, we are in a static class. Nothing is moving. So we are going to assume everything is not moving. But some of the forces must be equal to yeah. zero. That's Newton's first law. Newton's second law, of course, is when some of the forces are not equal to zero, so what's going to happen? It going, there is going to be a motion, correct? And the object is going to accelerate, and that becomes a dynamic problem. So some of you immediately want to take your dynamic course after the Static, that's the subject that is going to be involved, which is not, of course, a static. We are not going to use it. So law number two is not applied to us. And law number three that I'm sure some of you are familiar is that if you have two masses close to each other, they are going to exert forces equal and opposite. So those two forces are equal. And then a formula is given for that force, which is equal to m1, m2 times g, which is the gravitational force, depend where you are, or on Earth, or on Moon, or where you are, divided by r squared, r being the distance between the two. Is that correct? Are we going to use that? Law number three, no. But somehow, or some version of it, we are going to use, because every time that we have an object and we cut the object, like the leg of this uh, microphone, we cut the object, the forces there must be equal and opposite in two sides of the body. So in a way, yes or no, but not in this format. So that's why that does not concern me. So what we are going to talk about constantly in this class is this, and the object is in stationary, not moving anywhere. So that's the rule that you have seen it in physics. Now, there is another point which is very important, is how do we handle with the number? Because your calculator goes to three, four, five digits. You have 10 to the power of four here, 10 there. However, we have an accuracy procedure that you should all follow, and that is we need, we need three minimum of three digit for every number. Now, three digit does not mean three decimal point. Everybody get the point. So I don't mean go to three decimal point, not at all. Means for each number, no matter how large or how small it is, you need at least minimum of three digit. The rest of it, you can put 10 to the power of six or 10 to the power of three in front of it. For example, if you have 367, 1,432, for example, your calculator shows something like that. This, with three-digit accuracy, can be 367 times 10 to the power of 3. How many digits do I have? How much you lose here is insignificant. Everybody understands that. However, if you have 1, this is another example, divided by 3, and you put here 0.33, that's not correct. Everybody, because it's not three digits, it's only this compared to the original number, you are losing more here than you are losing here. Although this is 432 units, but this is not comparable. Everybody understand that. If you multiply that number by 10, by 10 million, you can see how much you, lo you lose there. Everybody under, because the number are compared to each other, not, I mean, to each type of number, not the big, large number will be never compared to a small number. Is that understood? So anytime you have a sine or cosine, don't put 0 0.78 or 0 0.20. You must go to at least three digits. Everybody 
got the idea here. So 1 over 3 would become equal to oh, 1 over 3. That's right. That become point 33, et cetera, is or uh, uh, 100 over, for example, 3 become 33.3. Okay, so these are correct procedure. Every one of them has three digit, three digit, three. So what, what, what I'm saying is this. If you have a large number, don't put the large number down. It's a waste of number. Use a prefix of 10 to the power of three or 10 to the power of six. Usually in engineering work, we don't use 10 to the power of four or five or seven and eight. In engineering work, we always use 10 to the power of three and six or 10 to the power of minus three and minus six. They have name if they were so big. As we go along, uh, we're going to explain it. Then uh, the other subject that I'm sure you are aware of, half of your problem is the metric system, half of your problem are in our own system, so you should be familiar to convert one to the other one. One thing that we are using constantly is this, that unit of the mass and unit of the force. So let me, I'm sure you all know that, but I have to mention that. In metric system, unit of the mass is kilogram. Yes or no? The minus of the for, unit of the force is Newton. That's right. Now, what's the unit of the force in our system? Is pound. But when you go to Europe to buy apple, you say two kilogram. Here you go, you say two pound. Yes or no? Well, something wrong there, is that correct? Yeah, we are, they are using mass, which you should use too, but here it is force. So in physics or in math classes, they gave you pound force, pound mass. Wrong, actually, that, that's, we are not going to use that. Anytime I want to give you the math, what's the unit of mass in our system? Slump, that's right. But next time going to the, one of the supermarket asked for, so many slug of apples. Okay, it doesn't work. So the, what the point is this. When I give you pound, when I give you kilogram, you have to multiply it by G to get the force. Yes or no? I have seen a student do that. I give them the pound, which is the unit of force, and then they multiply it by G. Don't do that. In other words, when I want to give you the mass, I will give you a slug. Is that correct or not? So that is the, something that I have to clarify. Now. These are the, a little bit of principle of the uh, physics that will be in first two problems. Also, those two problems are very important for me to see. One is the conversion of the unit. The other one, actually, I'm very interested in the other one. The other one, do not, I want in the problem number five, I want you to find out how many Newton is one pound. But I want, I want you not to use the table. I want you to use the data that's given in the problem. How to use that data, please make a note of that. In problem number five of your handout, use the data given in the problem to find out how many Newton is equivalent to one pound. That's problem number five. Then we go to chapter two, which is beginning of a static. Of course, in a static, we are dealing we want that in a static. We are dealing with the object load being applied to that object. Those loads could be weight, could be pull, could be spring force, could be contact force. Some of them you have already seen in physics, and the, you have also know that what are the forces? The forces must be vectors, and the vectors have magnitude and direction, etc., etc. In this class, remember that if you're showing a vector, you must show something like that or something like that. If it is non-vector, you should, or magnitude, you show it like that. This is a sample of the scalar number or non-vector, and that's the vector. So please be careful. Many students do not follow that. Anytime you have a vector, of course, if you are writing in the component, it has to have i, j, or K, everybody understand that because each force has two components or three components uh, depending whether you are looking at it at a 2D problem or a 3D problem. And that's sort of, of course, the unit of the force, everybody knows again, is the pound and Newton. And now the subject that we want to sort of review together, adding, adding vectors together. Of course, you all know that. In order to add the 
several forces together. Let's say that I have force F1. I want to add to force F2 I, and F3. You can put a few more if you want. That usually we write it like that in a vector form. F1 plus F2 plus F2 equal to R, which form a polygon. And that polygon is like that. You start from a point A, you put F1 there, and then F2, toe, head, toe, head, F2 there, and then F3 there. And then when you are finished with all the forces, then the, you connect the beginning of the first force to the end of the last force and that will be your r is that correct and that r again like a vector it has a magnitude and it has a direction and you are supposed to find out this is the formula you have done it however to do that we are going to use two methods that's why you see two line of homework there the first method is this so please write it down two methods learned for different reason one is using method one is using sine slash cosine rules obviously if I want to use sine and cosine rule I have to form a triangle because the triangle have three sides in order for me to be able to use sine rule and cosine rule everybody is familiar with sine rule cosine rule correct if not Look at your handout in one page of two of your handout or three. Please take a look there. In page, uh, yes, in the page four on the bottom of the page, notice on the left hand side is the, or right hand side, are the prefixes for, or, and from my side, from your side will be left side, is prefixes and the Sine rule and cosine rule are there, and this is the table of conversion that you may or may not want to use. However, and the second, let me tell you the second method, then we're going to give you, I, I'm going to give you example. The second method is using component of the force, which also you are familiar, component. Okay. This one is only good right in front of this one. The first one is only good if you have two forces and you find to find the result. And if you have more than two forces, three or four or five forces, you have to repeat the process again and again and again. It doesn't work, you know that. So let's get, so go through an example. Now, the example is the class exercises. So please go to the page that it says class exercise and take a look at the example that I have given you there. And this is just an exercise which is similar to problem 5 to 15, 4 to 15 there on the board. And look at the problem. There is a hook there which is driven into a wood, something like that. There is a force applied there. There is rope there which represents a force. It says F2. And there is a force going in that direction, F1. And the angle between the two is given 120 degrees. Correct? Do you see that in your handout, page six? Question is, what's the result of these two forces? Of course, since I only have two force, the, result, the polygon of the forces become a triangle because there's two forces and not one result and therefore the sine rule and cosine rule become applicable, yes or no. So let's form that uh, polygon. You can start, oh, let me give you the magnitude of forces. So F1 is given equal to 80 pound. Notice this is a magnitude, this is a vector. Notice you should follow the same rule for all your homework. And F2, magnitude of F2 is given equal to 60 pound, and the angle between two, the way it's shown, is equal to, obviously, the resultant is not 140. The resultant could be 140 if two lines are along the same line. Is that correct or not? However, here, the resultant is something else. Let's find out. Okay, put the F2 here with some scale, and then put F1 there with some scale, but notice that this angle is 120 degrees, so that angle becomes equal to 
60 degree crack. And then, as I said here, toe head, toe head, toe head, then the last, the first toe will be at, connected to the last head, which is your R. So your R here is, I can use a different color, your R here is, Okay, how do we calculate R? Of course, by sine rule and cosine rule. Which one, sine rule or cosine rule? I'm testing your knowledge of the math because you have lots of math prerequisites for this course. And I'll tell you this, if you are good in math, you become more successful in this class. If you are a little bit fuzzy about the principle of math, you need to work on it a little bit because lots of concept in this class will be math related. So please be aware of that. Is that correct or not? Now, cosine rule, because cosine rule is, if there is a triangle, everybody knows that C squared equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB times cosine the angle between the two. Yes or no? Here it's applicable because I have the value of F2. Yes? I have the value of F1, I have this angle, therefore cosine rule is applicable, therefore this consider the C, consider this A and AB, you don't have to write it like that, so R equal to square root of, or C square equal to the rest, which is A square, you don't have to write the formula because the formula is in your page four or five I gave you, I mentioned it before, but you apply that concept to this problem. Is it this square and that is square? This one is 80 square and the other one is 60 square. Is that correct or not? Yes? yes. Minus 2 times 80 times 60 times the angle between the two, which is 60 degrees. So cosine of 60 degree. And that is your R when you solve it with your calculator, of course. R ends up to be, look how I write the answer, 72.1 pound. How many digits did I use? How many digits did I use? I erase it here. Three digits. If there is another one you want to put extra digits, that's okay, but you need minimum of three digits. That's the rule, because otherwise you lose the accuracy of your number. Extra, it doesn't matter, but it's sometimes a waste of time if you have to do it. Okay, is this finished? Is the problem finished? No. Did you find the resultant? No. You need a direction of that, yes? To find the direction of that, you need this angle alpha or theta or whatever you call it. Is that correct or not? Yes? Because each vector has a magnitude and a direction. You already find the magnitude, you want the direction. Of course, for that one, you have to use the sine rule. Is that correct or not? Because we are looking at the sine rule is this sine of this angle over F2 equal to sine of 60 over R equal to sine of alpha over F1. Is that correct or not? Yes? So therefore, I can write here either one of them to solve for uh, alpha. So I can write F1. F1 was how much? F1 was, let's, I can do it in reverse order too. So let's put it this way. Sine of alpha over F1, which is 80 is equal to sine of 60 degree, which is this angle, over magnitude of r. Magnitude of r we already calculated to be 72.5. You can put pound and pound here, but they eliminate. Either way, correct? So you calculate alpha eventually equal to 73.9 degree. It's not a bad idea that always you have your calculator with you and then check my answer if you can quickly. So then we are in the same phase together. Now, what did we do here? We find a result and yes, a bunch of number. But for an, for an engineer, this means different. This was a cable with a capacity of how much? This is what static is all about. First few times that you go through the lecture, you think we are talking about a bunch of arrows going this way and that way, like what you see here. But really, that's not the case. 
every concept that we are talking in this class, you are going to use in all the engineering classes in future, <coughs> including my next class, which is ME218, which is a strength of material class. And we do lots of operation there. First, every problem I give you there, the first three steps is a static, then it start the strength of material. And this is going to be repeated. As I said earlier, the static is for everyone and for everything. So based on every problem, finding the forces and later on moment of each problem is essential part of engineering application in future. Everybody understand that. So you should take it seriously. You should spend about six to ten hours, depend your your restraint, on the set of homework. It's a serious case. But when you do that, you will be at the end you will be all smart because then you have learned a lot and you have built your foundation for future courses. Don't take this lightly. I have said that pre this in previous classes, so I must but mention here too. Static and the strength of material, both of them are fundamental courses. Not because I'm teaching it, or because I'm fortunate to teach that, because however, it's so important that anybody who get A and in a static and anybody get A in a strength of material, I guarantee I can give you sign signature that he or she will be a good engineer, a successful engineer even. Because it's so important to con grasp the concept of the principle that you are set up already for a much more difficult classes that come in future, you already have the base there. Yeah. However, that means lots of work. That means you cannot miss classes. I did not mention that, but as any other class, student from my class, you cannot miss classes. You have to spend about six to 10 hours in every set of homework. You need to do the homework by yourself. You cannot go to somebody else and say, what, how do I do this one? How do I do it? You're like a blind person. You take them, the hand, their hand, you go this way, that way. You are not learning them. This is, this is the fact of life. You need to do it yourself to get the idea. Doesn't matter. You cannot do 100% is no problem. Nobody actually can do the 100% of the problem. So anytime I see that one student getting 100% in every homework from the beginning to the end, it worries me. Because if you get 100% in your quizzes, you should get 100% or 90%. I'm sorry, in the homework, you should get 90 or 80% in the quizzes as well. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. So I see the homework is all there, but come to the quizzes, is not showing the result, something is missing there. Everybody, that missing means you are again copying it or you are getting lots of help, which is okay at the beginning. I didn't say that you shouldn't get help. You should get help, but you should try first yourself how far you move, put extra force there, go to your note, go to your example, etc., etc., and then when you need help, come to me or somebody else. Is that understood? You need lots of help as well. Therefore, what we did here is an engineering application. Look, there were a cable here used for, but how much was the capacity of cable? 80 pounds. This cable was 60. Can I take these two cables, replace it with one cable yes. with the same effect? Yes. yes. Isn't that cheaper process? <laughs> you see that? So if you are a designer, you are designing something and you want to put a cable, so you present that alternative. So I take these two cables, put one cable in this direction, everybody understand, which has the same effect and the same structure. It's much cheaper, much, so it's alternative. So every problem from now on looks like now if numbers or arrows in future is all an engineering application. That's an example of that. Now, did you see this? Yes? What did I use here? Very simple sine rule and cosine rule. Let's go to one of my quizzes. Let's see whether you can do the same thing there. Go to quiz number one, sample quizzes. If you can duplicate this in that problem, that is the, right now you haven't done any homework, so you don't know what I'm talking about, but quite frankly, not this one, the, the boat. The boat, the one before. No, that's the same thing actually. Look at the boat. You see that? Does it look anything like this? Would you believe conceptually this is exactly the same? Yes. Now read the question why I'm erasing the board and <coughs> tell me what you want to do in order to solve that problem. See, I haven't said much yet. I only gave you one little concept here, but this is a good practice for future. 
So if you listen carefully, that's what I said earlier, you listen to me carefully, make a good note, and then you will see all the answer that you want for all your homework is in your note. So your best reference is your note, then it is the book. That's what I said. If you don't need the book, don't buy it, you know, if it's too expensive. However, as I said, it is a good book, you should have it. However, your best reference is your note and example on the book. If you make a good uh, note in class, that means you should always listen carefully. And uh, if you have any question, of course, you can always ask them. Now, let's look at that other problem. What's this problem we have there? It is a boat. Somehow, the engine is out, so it's not working. And here is the boat stopped here. Notice, and you try to get this boat to side of the river. So if you put a little hook like the other one and you draw a rope here, put it that way, the, the boat will move that way, yes or no? If I put another rope this way and do the same thing, it will move that way. But the object of this, this exercise is not to move the boat to this bank or to this bank, to move it along the center line, yes or no? Correct? So what he's saying is this, the resultant if you are going to be in this direction. Because we want perhaps two miles down the road, down the river, there is a village or something, we want to take the boat there for repair or whatever. Is that correct or not? Therefore, it requires two forces. What did I call those two forces? So let's go to the, therefore, okay. This one is F1. in this direction is force F1 and this direction is this rope, each rope represents a force F2 and the angles that given there, this angle is 30 degree and that angle is 40 degree, correct? I hope this is clear enough, yes? All right, what else is given? Notice the magnitude of R is given equal to 1,500 Newton. The resultant has to be horizontal. Can you connect the two problems together, guys? Any suggestion? I said it's the same, so I have to put a polygon of forces, which are triangle. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. I know the resultant should be along horizontal line, yes or no, correct? Yes. So I have to start somewhere, let's start with F2, like the other one. So I'm starting with F2. The only problem is that F2 is not no. So the question you want to put here always, this is the data. The handout that I gave you one page, how to look at the problem is this. You always look at the data, these are all the data is given. Then you look at the what is the object of this exercise? What are we trying to do? In this problem, we are trying the question being asked. In other words, what is the question? Magnitude of F1 and F2, reverse of the other one. That's the only difference between the two is reverse of the other one. The other one, F1 and F2 given, you wanted to find R here. R is given, you want to find F1 and F2 with a little twist there, which I will. So F1 magnitude and F2 magnitude are the question that you want to answer. So now, in between the two is the concept. What concept are we using is concept of sine rule and cosine rule. Is that very simple? Everybody understand? Why not apply the same technique to every other concept that I'm going to talk the next 10 weeks, but some of them are very difficult, but that's the same way. You learn the concept, doesn't matter. It will be applied Anyway, everybody understand, and that is my hope that I motivate you enough to look at every problem like that, get the point, and connect those points together. Everybody, and that connection is engineering work. You go out of college, you sitting in my office, you are in a, a, a consultant office. The project comes to you. First of all, the project is not something easy to do. It's, 10,000 times more difficult as the, like your homework because if somebody can do it from the internet or from the uh, sources available to them, they do it. They don't come and pay you, yes or no? When they come to pay you, there's something 
more difficult that you have. Then your job as an engineer is, okay, I know this much physics, I know this much math, I know this much static, that much strength of material. Can I put all of this together to come up with a conclusion? That is what I said, connecting point. That connecting point is practiced through the homework. Now, here we go. So F1 is there. So I don't know the magnitude of that, but I know the direction of that. The direction of that is at? 30 degrees, yes or no? But it goes somewhere, we are stop somewhere, it's gone. So let's assume that's the end of it. Then, at that, that end, I have to put F1 there, yes or no? But F1 is going which way? F1 is going down. So if this is the horizontal line, I have to put F1 in this direction, and that angle is, how much that angle is? This is the one I drawn, it's not in the scale. Is that correct or not? Yes? Okay, where should I end up here? Some of your homework will not be done like this. Here, some, you may end up here, you may end up down there, as long as you are in this line. But none of them is correct except one. Where should I end up? Where should be the end of that vector? Horizontal. horizontal, because the resultant has to be horizontal. horizontal. So I cannot end it here. If I end up here, my resultant looks like that. If I end here, my resultant looks like that. Because it says the resultant should be horizontal. I want the R to be this. Therefore, F2. This was the only thing different between the two problems. Look like that. Oops, sorry for that mess. So here is F2 and here is F1. Now, this is 30 degree. This is, of course, 30 degree. This is 40 degree. So what's that angle? That angle is? 110, 180 minus 70 degrees. So that angle is 110 degree. Of course, this angle is 40 degree. Is this exactly what I did a minute ago? I don't know, I erased it there. Is that what you have in your note? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Correct? So the problem is solved. Can you solve it? Okay, so what is the magnitude? Of course, here, look what is given. The magnitude of R is given. So therefore, the angle, so you can use actually sine. You can use sine of reverse of the other way. Yes, we can use sine of 110 degree over R, over R, which was 1,500 Newton, must be equal to, for example, sine of 40 degree over magnitude of F2. And you write another one, F1. As you see, the rest is very simple, because you already done your job by coming up with this polygon or this triangle. Is that correct or not? Yes? OK, good. So therefore, let me give you the answer. So you go to do the answer. So uh, for F2, it become 1,000. I believe F2 become equal to 1,026 Newton. You always have to shoot your, you can write this at 1030 as three digits if you wish. And F1, I use four digits. Magnitude of F1 becomes 798 Newton. This just was explanation because this is the first class that how this conceptual concept of the subject that I'm teaching you will be repeated again and again and again. You need to do one problem properly 50 other problems look the same to you. When you don't learn it, that's where the problem is done. Then anytime you look at it, it still is a mystery. You don't want to solve that mystery one for yourself. That's why it's so important. So in other words, don't work for that five point, please. Work for the other 50, five point by doing your homework yourself. That was my idea at the beginning. And I stress this, no, you don't know how important this is until you ask other students who have been successful in this class. Every one of them, without exception, will write to you, do the homework, do it yourself. I hope you have read all their comments. Yes or no? Or some of them, I don't know. <laughs> Is that what they say? More or less? All right, OK. Now, this is now here. These three, three problems is that subject. They are u sine and cosine. This is the rest of the material we are going to talk about, which are component of the force that you are very familiar with as well. But let's, let's go over that 
uh, as for review because I don't want anybody anything to be left out. And that now we are talking a component of forces. Okay. In general, let's talk about in general and then we make it more specific. In general, if you have a force here and, <coughs> and you have two lines here, line one and line two, and you want to project that F over line one and line two, you have done that in the past in physics classes. At the end of this lecture, you derive, derive I mean, or you draw a line parallel to L2, and also you draw a line parallel to L1. Is that correct or not? And this force here in blue become F1, and this force here become F2. These are the two components of F, F over line F1 and F2. Look at this polygon of the forces because this side and this side are equal, yes or no? But if this is F2, this must be F2 as well. So look, F1 plus F2 equal to F. Is that correct or not? So here we go, vector-wise. F equal to F1 plus F2 in general. There is a handout problem there that I don't have time to do it. There are some homework assignments that there is a cable or there's a force and you want to project that over two lines, you use that triangle, either triangle, the lower one or the upper one, if you have the data given to you. Is that correct? Like what I used here, because if you look at it, that's the same problem. F1 plus F2 equal to F, so you use sine rule, cosine rule, you can solve it. But this is the component of the force over two arbitrary lines. In many cases, they do, uh, those are not arbitrary lines. Those are x and y axis, which we call it Cartesian component, yes or no. So therefore, instead of that, if your two lines L1 and L2 become x, oops, sorry, x are and y axis, and this is your f vector, the same is applied. So all you have to do, draw a line here parallel to y axis, draw a line parallel to the x axis, and then <coughs> the way we do it, because I draw that blue, so this is fx as a vector, yes or no? And this is f1. Okay, the following formula that you have seen it in physics applies from now on to every problem. I'm going to erase this because I need larger area. So I'm erasing this and write all the components there. First of all, look what are the way I have writing it. So please distinguish between the vector and the scalar number or non-vector. So please write it the following. If I write F equals to F1, plus F2. Is that a correct statement or not? Obviously it is. Is that correct or not? Because that's the sum of the two vectors, right? However, we know from the past that the unit vector, okay, what's the unit vector now? Let's explain that. I wish everybody knows what the unit vector is. But I'm going to put on the side here another idea that you already know. Okay, this is a vector, let's say U, which has a magnitude of three pounds. Yes? This is a vector, unit vector. Unit vector, obviously, we, from in this book, we are going to call it lambda, and <coughs> magnitude of the lambda is one pound. Yes? And this is lambda. This is u. Look, look at the size of it. This is one pound, and this is three pounds. So three of this fits into that, yes or no? So your formula that you have seen in the past is like that. Each vector equal to, if I want to apply this, this is three times of this, become three times lambda. Yes or no? Yes? yes. U equal to three lambda. <coughs> Correct? So therefore, each vector equal to its magnitude times a times its unit vector. Are we going to use this formula? Believe me two, three hundred times in this class. So please remember that. Each vector 
equal to its magnitude times a unit vector. The unit vector has a magnitude of 1. This is done in this direction. Of course, I'll talk about x and y again. So that formula is one of the formula constantly being used. And then reverse of that. Sometimes I give you the vector and I give it your magnitude. You want to find the direction, you, how do you find that? Lambda, the direction of the vector, equal to what? The vector itself divided by its magnitude. So this two formula is going to be applied to all the rest of the problem there, problem 9, 3, 4, and 5. Is that correct or not? Remember, up to here, you use sine and root. This one is physics. This one are sine and cosine rule. This, all of that. Although, in some of this, in the book, even in the equilibrium problem, in the book they are using sine and cosine, I suggest you not to use it and use component. Do not follow the solution manually in order. To just use your own initiative. Anyhow, now, everybody knows the unit vector around the x-axis, we call it i. The unit vector around y-axis, we call it j. J. Therefore, the following formula is all applied to some of your homework, and that is this. F1, uh, oh, sorry, here I should change it not to F, because I call it, see, I use here F1 and F2. Here I should use Fx, and you did not mention that. I'm making it, I call it Fx, Fy, not, F, not F1, F2. So that is equal to Fx plus Fy. Yes or no? Yes. However, Fx is equal to its magnitude using this technique times a unit vector, correct? And Fy become equal to Fy magnitude times unit vector there. So simplifying the two together, so putting this into equation one, so F become equal to Fx i plus Fy j. This is magnitude, direction, magnitude, direction. Of course, the direction has, is a, has a vector. So this is another form that you have used a lot in physics. Now, if I give you this angle theta, obviously fx equal to what? fx equal to fx magnitude-wise, equal to f times cosine of theta. This is cosine, this is sine. Everybody agree? Yes? Are you with me? Fx equal to, these are physics, right? This you have learned it in the past. This is nothing to do with the static yet. I'm reviewing some of the principle of math. Fx equal to, equal to F times what? Cosine of theta. Fy equal to what? F times sine theta. In this class, I have seen this happen. I hope none of you are in this, in this category. I have seen a student have a problem trying to find out sine and cosine. This is odd to me. Why is odd? Because we are going to talk about so much math in the higher level, and you are still stuck there on the bottom that you don't know which one is sine, which one is cosine. We have lots of problems to resolve. Is that correct or not? It means, in other words, your math should be a little bit more advanced than that. So I don't want that formula, some of you put <coughs> RHT, I don't know what, I don't know yet what that is. To, in order to find sine and cosine, you don't have time to do that. It is the, the adjacent is always equal to cosine, the front is always is sine, as simple as that. Is that correct or not? So therefore, I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. This is F cosine and this is F sine, correct? You put it there, so you sit, again, you put it back that in that equation, this is one form, this is the second form, and this is the third form that you have seen a lot of that. Equal to F times cosine theta I plus F sine theta J. Oops, sorry. And since F become a common factor, so I can bring it out, so write it as cosine theta I plus sine theta J. Each vector, these are component along the i and j. However, when I get this as common factor, this is magnitude, this must be what? This must be? Direction. Direction. Although you were using sine 
uh, cosine and theta and sine theta, but remember this because next week we are going to go to 3D problem and we are going to reverse this and that is where it comes to. The reason I'm, only reason I'm explaining something very simple that you already know there to you to look at it a little bit differently in order to find out what I'm going to do for 3D problem, which is as well, it's very simple, but you have two idea. In here, with one angle, I can use two, one, cosine and sine. Everybody understand that, to express my lambda. In other words, write it down in your note. This must be according to this equation. Each vector equal to magnitude and in direction. This is the vector. This is the magnitude. This must be the direction. Therefore, if this is lambda, so write something new for yourself. Lambda x actually equal to cosine of theta and lambda y is equal to sine of theta and everybody knows that lambda x squared plus lambda y squared is equal to one. one because that's cosine is theta squared plus sine theta squared. That's the reason. Is that correct or not? Yes. We use this format for 2D, which is obvious because many of you have used it this way, but we expand that into a 3D problem for a 3D problem. We keep this in mind until we get there. Is that correct or not? Yes? yes. Now, now, when we add the vectors together, this is the representation of the vector. These are the formula, which I keep using it here and there. This is the representation of the vector there. Then we want to add this vector together. Now let's add these two vectors together in a simple format and see what we end up with the formula, whether I have time to do example or not. We'll leave it for next time, but let's put it this way. I have here, let's do a simple example. Let's say here we have an xy coordinate axis. So here we go. Let's say we have here a vector going like that which has a component of, let's say, 5 and 3. So it has 5i and 3j going like that. Is that correct or not? Yes? And let's have another, this is f1. So if I write f1 here in that format, as everybody see, it's 5i plus 3j. Let's give it a unit of time. I can change it to Newton. Then, Let's look at another vector here, F2, which has here, let's say, 3 and 6. OK. How do we represent F2 now? F2, of course, is equal to 3i plus 6j. Correct? OK. Where is the result? like what we did earlier. Where is the result? This is why I'm trying to form a polygon. I started from O, toe, head, toe, head, yes? So this is only two. So I'm putting the result, and now this must be the result and R, yes or no? OK. This is what is the concept of we are using in this problem number 31, 40, and 41. R equal to F1 and plus F2, the black plus black equal to the green. Yes or no? Correct? Vector one. These are a vector. This is not number. Number doesn't match that. Everybody will show you that. Is that is that vector? Because that means the polygon, or in this case, triangle. Is that correct or not? Yes? Notice if this is more than two or three, you cannot use this method. You have to use the component. Is that correct? So there is two different methods there. Here I'm still using the triangle. Anyhow. Now look at the Rx. Is this from here to here? If I draw a line here from here down here, what's Rx equal? It's called 5 plus 3. Yes or no? Yes. So please write it down. Since this is equal to R, is equal to Rx, I plus Ry, J, pound. These are all happening with the pound. By looking at this problem, I have to get F1x plus F2x and add it together, yes or no? So therefore, Rx become equal to F1x plus F2x. You can have many more. Or from now on, we're showing it like that. Summation of all the forces in x direction. Which for our problem become what? 3 plus 5 equal to 8, yes or no? 
So write it in this format. So Rx is summation. Doesn't matter whether Fx is positive or negative. It may go there, there, then it come back. So doesn't matter. Two of them are positive, one of them are negative. But the resultant, my resultant has a component along the x equal to F1x, F2x, F3x, F4x, it doesn't matter how many is there. Is that correct or not? Which is from now on is this formula. So these are the concepts you have to use. Rx equal to summation of Fx in magnitude. Correct or not? Yes? What is Ry now equal to? Notice Ry equal to, unfortunately this is 3 and this is 3. I should use different numbers. This is 3 and 6. It is? Nine. So what I'm doing here, so Ry is equal to, I don't have to repeat that, Ry is summation of the forces in the y direction. So these two formula will be handy from now yeah, to solve for summation of Fy. Okay. This becomes two equations independent for each other. Now let's go back to the boat. Could I, have used, could I have used this method instead of triangle method? But remember, it says, what did it say? It said the resultant of the forces are horizontal. What does it mean? Salvation of Fy must be equal to? Zero. zero. This is the conclusion that you have to come up with. So sometimes in some of your homework assignment, the summation is horizontal. That gives you a data. If the summation is vertical, vertical that means that sigma fx equal. In other words, this is part of analysis. If they don't show you that, you discover that through the homework. Yes or no? Now, what we are saying is this. If I want my result, and which is the green one, to, would, to be the vertical, this is rr. No matter how many vectors I have, they should start here. Going there, going there, going there. Yes or no? In yes. order to be resultant, if I'm going here four and four forward, I should be coming three and five backward to make it equal to zero. So summation of the forces along the x must be equal to? Which gives me a formula to use. Is that correct? Use that. So this is when resultant is vertical. Or when the resultant is horizontal, like that, Again, look what happened here. Depend again. Depend how many vector you have. One of you cannot have one up to be two or more, but depends how many you have. You may have something like that, but then you should end up like that. Is that that means no matter how much you go up, you should come the same amount down. The result must be equal to z. Now, if I tell you like question number one, the sum of the, all the forces equal to zero, then what's going to happen? which is, remember, Newton's first law? R must be equal to? So then what? Both of them must be equal to zero. Yes, I already told you. This one, you just write it down. This one means sigma f x must be equal to zero. Yes or no? Correct? In order R to be vertical, sigma f x must be equal to? Zero. zero. This one? Since R is horizontal, write it down. If the picture is that. This one requires sigma F Y to be equal to zero. Right? What I said, let's do that, repeat that next time. We are out of time anyway. So that is the, we are, what, you, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use one or two examples here similar to the component and immediately move to, next, next class, we move to equilibrium of Particle, equilibrium of particle according to Newton laws, must sum of the forces must be equal to zero, zero or must be equal to zero. Zero. those two equations must be equal. Both of them. So that is conclusion that we are saying. Thank you very much, guys. So thank you. All right. I I need I don't need the syllabus.